This is a conversation with Steve Masensky, who is the open source robotics engineering lead at Samsung Research America. Steve leads the NAV2 project, which is an open source robot navigation framework. In this interview, Steve and I talk about the problem and challenges in robot navigation, how NAV2 works at a high level, hybrid planners, and about Steve's experience working with the NAV2 community. This is the SenseThink Act podcast. I'm Audro Nash. Thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. And now, here's my conversation with Steve. Hi, Steve. Would you introduce yourself? Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, Steve Musensky. I'm the open source engineering lead uh, for robotics at Samsung Research. Um, so I'm the lead developer on the ROS2 navigation stack, and I sit on the TSC uh, for, for ROS2 as well. And the TSC is the Technical Steering Committee. So. Correct. Yeah. So it's like the, the board for ROS, let's say. Um, so it's a bunch of different companies that kind of come together with interest in ROS2 to make sure that we can uh, steer the project in the right direction. Oh, yeah. Uh, tell me a bit about the navigation stack or na and then how that relates to NAV2. Um, so, I mean, the navigation stack was the, the, um, you know, the software built at Willow Garage to do, um, you know, mobile-based navigation, you know, primarily for the PR2 robot. But, uh, you know, even in those early days, they understood that a lot of the same technology could be applied to other robot platforms. Um, so, I mean, th at the time, I mean, it was awesome. The fact that there was a software out there that was free and open source and with a strong community around it uh, with documentation mm -hmm. and examples and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but, you know, over, over time, you know, that, that was, you know, in the very early days of robotics where basically the only robot you could buy if your home was like, uh, you know, an iRobot Roomba. Um, and there mm -hmm. really were few, if any, kind of service robots, you know, in, in application. What um, year do you think this was? Was this like 20, 2000 or when do you think it was? It's like 2010-ish uh, is when it, when it started. And then um, there was a big uh, push to update some of the algorithms. And I think the summer of 2011, 2012, when um, a bunch of interns kind of came in. And add some new, new new variations of the algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had this open source navigation stack, mm -hmm. um, and that was with Willow Garage. And then how did that evolve? Like, how, how did that? How did we go from there? Yeah. So so after Will closed in in the 2013 timeframe, um, kind of all major development on the navigation uh, kind of kind of halted. Um, mm -hmm. So you had folks like uh, David Liu and Mike Ferguson that continued to maintain things over time. Um, so da so um, David was um, you know working at Locus Robotics and working as a consultant doing doing various navigation work. Um, and then Mike Ferguson was starting what what, what was the precursor to Fetch Robotics, and then later Fetch Robotics. Um, and so he was using in the early days some of the navigation stuff. Um, I think these days I have to assume everything's been stripped out of their systems at this point. But um, in the early days, they're trying to build that MVP to get the uh, the venture capital money. Um, that that's, he was working on on the navigation stack for that as well. Um, but then you know nothing really major changed from from 2013 basically um, until about you know 2019 or so when. Um, you know, Ross 2 started hitting kind of more mature uh, milestones. So I think mm -hmm. with, with Bouncy is when uh, Matt Hansen and the open source uh, Robox team at Intel um, had a big post on Discord saying that, hey, they want to work on this Ross 2 navigation stack. Um, they didn't want it to just be a straight port from Ross 1. They wanted to redesign it from the ground up based on like the current requirements. And we're basically is asking people to air their grievances about the Ross 1 stack um, or what kinds of things they were swapping out the stack because they didn't meet their requirements. Um, and so that, that actually that discourse post, I still today occasionally open up and, and go down a list of you things to, to make sure, yeah, to make sure like, okay, oh, like I forgot about this. We still haven't addressed this point and I'll add that to my queue. Um, but at this point, a lot of those, a lot of the broad things that people have said are, are, have now been handled uh, for the most part. Um, hmm. so, uh, really, um, um, Matt, um, and, and the team at Intel, um, really put like the legwork in to get this, get the, get the ball rolling. Um, and when they did, that's kind of when I, when I jumped on, on the bandwagon, uh, to, to start working on things. Um, but that, that's essentially how, how the NAP2 project, uh, kind of, kind of got going, um, and how we got a lot of the architectural elements we see today. Gotcha. So if I understand correctly, so it was started at Willow Garage in 2010 ish and the, uh, as a general navigation library, and then Ross one came out and um, it was used with ROS1. So the general navigation code was used in ROS1. It continued and people were using that. And then ROS2 came out in an early version. You said bouncy. And then um, you then asked the community for what was wrong or what could be improved. And then this is how we have come to NAV2. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's it. It wasn't me. That was, that was Matt and the, the team at Intel. They they were really the ones in the early days when we were porting stuff over and starting to do some of the core architectural elements that were uh, taking the lead. Um, so I think they had like six people working on it. Um, so they, mm-hmm. there was a, a lot of uh, professional uh, software engineering time put into it um, in, in those early days. Nice. And how did you get involved? Yeah, um, so I've been kind of doing open source stuff for for a bit before that point. Um, so when I was leading the robotics team at Symbi Robotics, I built um, the SDVL uh, layer as well as the SAM Toolbox library. Um, and so I'd already done a couple of Roscon talks on, on those topics. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, Samsung was looking to hire somebody to work in the open source group on various open source robotics technologies. And they'd reached out to Matt Hansen asking kind of who, who they might recommend that would be good for this. Um, and uh, they said that, you know, I, I might be a good, good, good candidate. Um, at the time, I, I was um, leaving Symbio Robotics, and so it was a really good transition to go over to Samsung Research um, to, to work on this open source technology full time versus just, uh, you know, working on these problems that are specific to Symbi uh, for the Symbi products and then open sourcing the little bits here and there that make sense to open source. Um, you know, now I can start working on open source things and make big infrastructure changes that are, that are fully in the open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. It's an awesome position to be in. Yeah, um, it's fun. Oh, yeah. With, um, so tell me kind of at a high level, what problems does Nav2 solve or work to solve? Yeah, yeah so, so Nav2 Nav is, is, is basically sitting between you have a bunch of motors and a motor controller that can you know take, take velocity commands to go forward and your autonomy application where you want to have a robot, you say, I want robot to go there. So it kind of deals with everything in the middle from the, the mapping and localization systems, which I consider to be slightly separated from navigation. I consider the navigation one problem set and localization to be another problem set. But we do have reference implementations that work with AMCL and SAM Toolbox for that localization element. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the navigation side, then we say, well, now that we know where we are within some global representation of the world and we have this global representation of the world, um, how do we, you know, navigate the space in order to, you know, go to our to our, our our final goal? So this could be in a warehouse, like the position on a shelf where you want to go have go pick a box, or with your your Roomba, say, you know, what's this little pattern I want to map out on the floor in order to clean my space? Um, so we solve that problem of saying, uh, how do we take some sensor data uh, from from just hardware and populate? a representation of our environment given the current state of the world. Um, mm-hmm. And then once we have the state of the world, how do we make a, a route that goes from where I am to where I want to be within that environment? And then finally, um, dealing with the the lower level system of, okay, how do I now follow this path that goes from where I am to where I want to be um, accurately and efficiently? Um, and there's obviously more you know, little you know, bells and whistles and widgets uh, here and there to help make that you know, either more efficient or more r- r- configurable or deal with uh, fault tolerances and things like that. Um, but that, that'd be kind of the, the core problem of navigation that Nav2 tries to solve. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it sounds like several things. The, the, how, do you, um, how do you find a good delimiter between Nav2 and other ROS libraries? Like ROS2 Control, for example, or Move It, or any of these other ones. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess these all would be kind of parallel pillars. I mean, these are all by themselves really significant applications um, that mm-hmm. have their own specific developer code bases and, and own own individual ecosystems um, and are, but they themselves, you know, equivalently complex uh, challenges to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Um, move it, I say, is it, in, in the most simplistic terms, is, is ARM navigation, which is actually the, the, the library name from Wheel Garage that became uh, Move It was ARM <laughs> navigation. So yeah. it's solving the same kinds of problems as, as the mobile robot navigation that Nav2 solves, but for, for ARM. So it's taking um, potentially sensor data to build an environmental representation. In the case of, of Move It, they're using Octomap with 3D Octrees. Um, then they're um, you know, using you know, sampling-based motion planning in order to get, get a, a, a rough plan from point A to point B and using various smoothing techniques, usually optimization-based, to smooth those out to be a little bit less clunky on the, on the motors while you're, while you're going through than a sampling-based planner would give you na- naturally. Um, mm-hmm. And then finally, then having those, the same kind of um, local uh, trajectory controllers we have in Nap2 now uh, with the, the hybrid planning schema. So there's solving a very, very analog problem. Pretty much everything that exists in Nav one, Nav two rather, um, and move it have some sort of direct analog to each other for the most part. Um, and then um, you know, Ross control is is kind of sitting at that, that that lower level on the actual electronics, solving the motor control issue of saying, mm-hmm. um, you know, I have this, I have this motor, and I want to control this motor to do something interesting for me. So if you have a differential drive robot. 
um, how do I um, take this this velocity command I get from navigation and and follow that um, with with my my motor efforts um, or for manipulation, which is frankly more of what ROS control is used for. Um, it has you know more advanced um, impedance controllers and, and other other type of modeling to deal with um, you know the kind of manipulation problem. Um, for for the most part, the navigation control systems at the lower level are you know very simple, right? This is the kind of stuff that uh, undergraduates might do in their 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 intro to controls uh, lab. Um, it's not not overly complex. Mm -hmm. Like a like a proportional integral derivative or PID controller kind of thing, or uh, yeah, for controlling uh, a motor to try to get it to a position. Yeah, pig controls are, pr are pretty pretty common, um, as well as um, if, if potentially if you're working on a warehousing robot where you have um, you know different different weights of of ob objects put on top of it. Um, you, you, there's other um, slightly more advanced control scheme that you might use um, that, that's based on on um, uh, efforts rather than just just uh, uh, motor currents. Gotcha. Now, why is can, can you tell me some of the challenges in making something perform navigation? Like, what are some of the problems that Nav Two is solving, and there's some flexibility around the ways it solves it. I assume. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is just taking both the representation of your environment you have from from mapping or localization or you know other previous data that you've collected and somehow assembled, um, and then the current data you have about the environment. So, if you have a um, a two D laser scanner on it, or you have a um, RGBD camera on it, which which mm -hmm. provides you depth information as well as color camera information, um, and, and you know radars, sonars, you know top sensors. I mean, there's there's, there's a large variety of different sensors that you can utilize on a robot. Um, and most robot systems actually have multiple of these these types of sensors on them. Um, so it, the problem is dealing with how do I take all that that set of information and populate something that is now useful to to solve the navigation problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that within the navigation stack with the the cost now 2D package, um, which is essentially a direct port from ROS one. We have some additional plugin layers we've added for more advanced capabilities, but you know high level exact same package. Um, long term, we'd like to re actually replace that with something a bit a bit more advanced, but um, at the moment, that, that's where we're at. Um, hmm. So that's one of the big problems. Another big problem is saying, okay, well, now that we have this populated representation of my environment with current sensor data that's being fused into it, um, how do I actually plan within that space so that my robot can can you know achieve its goal? And so there's a yeah. variety of different methods of, of doing that. Obviously, um, so there's there's you know holonomic planners that work well with like two D um, or uh, grid basically techniques that work very and well with. Uh, holonomic, it means um, it's like a car or something, right? A non-holonomic um, robot can drive like sideways and things where a car has to go forward or backward. That's what holonomic uh, means, right? Or so, backwards. So the yeah, yeah, ah. backwards. So hol holonomic means it can move in any direction. So think about um, a um, a robot with... Um, Swiss wheels um, or whatever they're called? Or Yeah, yeah, those little roller wheels, yeah. Um, the, um, or, or potentially where you can pivot the wheels themselves to be able to move sideways. Um, yep. Those are considered to be holonomic robots. Um, on, on a first order approximation, we also say that differential drive robots, if they're circular, are also holonomic because mm -hmm. if you can pivot perfectly in place as a differential drive robot and you're circular, so your 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 footprint isn't moving, you can you can achieve the same kind of behavior as as with a a truly holonomic robot. Because um, you just so change the angle it's facing, and then you can drive anyway. I see. Yeah. For, yeah, precisely. Um, so for those kind of robots, it, it's really easy to leverage just like, you know, your usual A-star Dijkstra's algorithm that you might learn in like an intro to algorithms class. Um, mm -hmm. you know, those are perfectly serviceable. Um, you'd probably want to do some smoothing on it if you were doing a direct grid search so that you don't have like little jaggedy lines on things. Uh -huh. but, um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, there's, there are different ways we do that through like navigation functions, which are basically generating these potential fields um, of, of cost that you're, you're back tracing on instead of just like directly just doing a grid search. Um, but I mean, at, 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 at a, at a, a, at a, a, um, conceptual level, they're, they're, you know, the same kind of class of algorithm, um, as Dyke shows an A star. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of it, it, they solve the same kind of problems. Yeah. Um, they're, they're giving Which, you a path through space. Yep. And it, if I remember correctly, so, um, for A star, it's a heuristic based search. So you say the goal is that way and I'm going to try to search in that direction. And then you find um, the optimal, in a grid world, you find the optimal solution of um, what's the shortest path to get there. Yeah. Um, and what was uh, Dijkstra's, is it, it's, it's is it a more general just, thing or? 
I forget how it relates. It's just breath first. It just goes in every direction at the same time. So that mm-hmm. you're, you don't have, there's not a heuristic that, that's saying like, go in that direction. It's just going to go out and expand until it finds the, the optimal solution. Uh, okay. And then, um, so for these, if you have a start and an end spot, and so it's going to search the space and it's going to find it. And we're representing space in a grid world or some sort of mm-hmm. representation. And so that's why you would have these kind of jaggedy edges um, rather than a smooth way to get there per se if it yeah, would say you go up in a diagonal to the grid yeah so so you have like a you basically the motion model motion model so to speak that you're using is is the the, the search neighborhood so you're saying mm-hmm. i can search you know left right up down for like the the four connected neighborhood or you're saying up down you know um, up down left right and then the diagonal so that's the eight connected space um and so that, that'll mm-hmm. let you then work at you know have your plan go at 45 degrees but you're still restricted only to these these you know exact ing- angle increments of either going you know zero ninety or forty five degrees um, um, for your planner. Um, so this works you know fairly well um, when you're working with just um, you know a simple you know simple base that like you might see on your on your on your Roomba. Mm-hmm. Um, but where this kind of breaks down and becomes more of a significant issue is when you're working with um, you know larger non circular robots. So think about like a forklift, or you're thinking about like um, I think Vector Robotics sells like a big platform yep. robot i don't i don't know what they call it uh it's like something 1500 but i forgot what the, the thing is yeah um, and those are obviously like very non-circular and so even though they, they are a difficult drive robot and can pivot in place yep. you do need to do a bit bit more work to make sure that it, it's it's um it's oh. viable to plan through a space when you are in a narrow aisle way where maybe the robot can't just trivially rotate in place because it, um, it could swing and hit something because it yeah, exactly. Say it's rectangular or something. Okay. Yeah. And, and the other big kind of class of, of, of uh, problem that you, that you have working with those techniques is um, when you have um, drive trains that aren't, you know, trivi- that you can treat essentially as holonomic. So you mentioned before, like cars, like the Ackerman model, which is, is the, the, the car model we talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's, that's one example of, of an, where if you just plan a path that says, go here, go straight to the right. Um, you know, your car can't do that, right? That, that's not, that's not a feasible way of, of getting from point A to point B for the actual drivetrain of the robot. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to then take into account, um, not just like the, the emotion model of saying this for a connected space, but instead using in your search space, your search space planner, um, actual motion primitives that better describe the capabilities of your drivetrain. Um, and that's where we have some of the new algorithms that nav provides in the snack planner, um, which is the hybrid A-star planner and the state lattice planner, which, which both huh. um, enable you just to set um, different search patterns um, so that you can create feasible, feasible paths that um, robots with, with, with constrained drivetrains can actually um, uh, navigate exactly and not, 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 um, uh, uh, not, not, not treat as a holonomic. So by search patterns, you mean kind of simulating the position in space um, to try to see if it's valid from one position to another. So like I have a car, I'm going to try to move it from one spot to another, and I'm going to kind of project it out into the future and try to see if that path gets us there. Or what do you mean by search? Yeah. So, so imagine in, in, in this, in this 2d example, we said, um, if I'm, if I'm, I'm at the cell, I can, the cells I can reasonably traverse are either up, down, or left, or right in this forecasted space. So that, that would be the motion model that we're, we're using to, uh, to, to expand search. Because then once we go, we go up, we apply the same four, and then you just keep doing that recursively, and, and you get, you know, eventually. Yep, like a chessboard, um, expand basically. Okay. Yeah. So um, with, for, for, for instance, let, let's, let's talk um, about the simpler one first. Um, so for hybrid A-star, um, which the name kind of breaking that down, you have hybrid. So you, you know, oh, there's something different about this than A-star. So you're still using this like heuristic search algorithm at, at its core. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that's doing is is what we're referred to as hybrid sampling, which is that instead of just naively saying, we're going to we're going to visit each of these grid cells just as the grid structure. Instead, we're going to treat um, our, our, our search neighborhood as primitives of actual uh, velocity commands the robot can achieve. So mm. for a car-like model, you can either turn left and drive a bit, you can either go straight and drive a bit, or you can turn right and drive And those a bit. are the primitives, so, the turn left yeah. a little bit, turn right a little bit, or go straight. Yeah. Or I suppose backwards as well, and backwards, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Precisely, yeah. So those and are so the, the primitives. The length of these, 
Yeah. And, and then, you know, for, for the, the sake of implementation, the length of these primitives you want to set as something interesting and not, you know, arbitrarily just like driving the future a bunch. Cause then you know the one, you just end up going in circles on your left and circles on the right and just go straight forever. Um, so you, <laughs> so you have to decide like, what are, what are the lengths of these things I want to work with? Um, okay. And you want them small the pa basically paper, so that you can find yeah. interesting things. Okay. So you don't go all the way in yeah. a circle if you turn your wheel a little bit to the left kind of thing. Yeah. But because we're also still working, so to go back, we're still working this grid space though. So mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we go a small amount, but it needs to be enough so that it guarantees that we leave our current cell. So as we're expanding the search over time, oh. that we don't have situations where we're revisiting the same cell we currently had, um, which is certainly something that, that, sounds that, hard. that can be dealt with. Yep. Yeah. It, or actually, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's all geometry. It, I, if yeah. you read the code in this, it's like, you know, six lines where I go through step by step how I geometrically drive this this this, this idea. Um, mm -hmm. But um, while the paper itself of the hybrid star from from Thrun and, and folks from the DARPA Urban Challenge um, or Grand Challenge, one of the challenges, um, <laughs> they they um, I think allow you to do that to have some sort of solution space for how they they select which one to use. Um, I instead say I don't even want to deal with that problem. I'm just going to make my primitive sufficiently long so we always are guaranteed to leave a cell. So they're at minimum square root of two cell lengths away from each other. So that way we're guaranteed for any any time that the uh, primitive hits a cell, it's always guaranteed to leave that cell in the next uh, iteration. And are we um, are cells always squares? Yeah. Um, well, I guess they don't they don't have to be, but uh, I mean, for, for the purpose of nap two, they are. Yeah. Gotcha. They could be circles. They could be hexagons. I've actually I I, I did some some research in a couple of papers. I've 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 uh, just some, uh, uh, not like written for publication, but written in terms of like you know notes I've taken mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, actually having an environmental model be based on hexa hexagonal cells rather than, than grid cells. Um, but that ends up having a whole lot of other issues. But it's an interesting <laughs> problem to think about. Huh. Okay, so you have this grid, and you have a way of describing how your robot moves in this grid. Um, if you have a robot that's like a car or something, you have some idea for if you tell it to drive forward at left for this angle or something, how it goes into another cell. How do you... Um, it just it sounds like a hard representation, because I'm imagining if I uh, turn the wheel 10 degrees to the left, like, and I drive, I'm not in the middle of a cell, but I guess I still am in a cell and you can use that for planning your trajectory. Yeah. Or... So rather than just, um, so with these grid based methods, we're essentially visiting, let's say like when I, oh, I go up, down, left and right. Yeah. Um, we could say that that you know you're you're not visiting an arbitrary place in that cell, right? Because if you blow up that any 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 you know space can be blown up infinitely to, oh, totally. to look at it. So we look at a little cell and make it really big. It's like well, we're not visiting any random place. We're visiting let's say the center or an edge, depending on how you want to define it of that cell. And each cell we're visiting the center of. But when you're working with these motion primitives, you're right. We don't actually have exact angle. Uh, these aren't computed so that we're we're ending exactly in the center of every single cell every single time. Yep. Um, so we do actually have to cache in the planning sequence where within that, 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 that cell we've actually landed. And then when we go back and we, we visit that cell to expand it again, we're actually we're not using the center of that cell. We're again using that, that position within the cell mm -hmm. that we actually visited, which then, you know, if you, you know, compound that over and over again to build a path, that means that it's exactly drivable in this grid space. I'm a little confused by that. Yeah. Um, so if you were if you were to have, for instance, like a naive implementation of this, you might think about saying, let's approximate that I had this 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 primitive that I'm I'm projecting forward at a curve and it yep. ends at within a cell, but not in the center of the cell. Mm -hmm. It might be natural for you to, to think if you come from an, from like a two D grid land space to say, oh well, you know these 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 cell, these these cells are sufficiently small that I can just store that as the as, as I've entered the cell. Mm -hmm. And then in the next iteration, when you when you visit that cell to expand it to get its neighbors, you could then say, okay, well, let, let's just pretend like we started at the center and expand that again. But if you keep doing that, the, the path you get at the end of it actually isn't then respecting the constraints on that motion model mm. um, because you're you're not act, you're, you're that those, those small errors compound each each um, individual primitive. I so think I see. instead of yeah, so instead of doing that, when we when we um, uh, we, we, we visit we visit a cell and we're trying to find its neighbors. We're not using an approximation of the position that we're we ended up real in that position. cell as like the center. We're using the real position of the actual cell coordinates used huh. so that as that compounds together, that it's going to be guaranteed to be drivable within the kinematics of, 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 the, of the, the, the robot system. 
Interesting. So how, how does it work if I want to go from one spot to another spot? And, and um, I have these motion primitives, which say I can turn. And for these motion primitives, if I have a car, um, do you have like basically infinite motion primitives because you have the whole degree of angles that the car can go? Or how does it... Um, how do you go from one spot to another? Do you know what I'm asking with the uh, motion primitive? Yeah, yeah. So, like you have the continuous so, so range we, between, say, minus 45 and positive 45 that the car could travel in, or that the wheels could face. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we subsample that space. Um, so essentially we have, um, for, for the hybrid star in the, in the current implementation mm -hmm. that, that exists today, um, you have a left turn, you have a right turn, you have a straight turn, and then you have the, the reverse equivalence of those things. So you have either three or six motion primitives you're working with mm -hmm. um, that, that are the, the most extreme terms, right, that the, your, your robot model can, can obtain. And it randomly um, samples it, it, in that space or, or it just uses one of the, uh, well, one of the six? We'll expand it. So we expand all of them, right? So every mm -hmm. time we visit a cell for from an A star, we expand every single cell and we set a heuristic cost at the end value of that cell that goes into a priority queue to sort um, oh, cool. by the the most optimal uh, trajectory possible. Huh. And then when we go back through and visit the next cell in that priority queue, you're getting back out that, that next cell that you want to go to. So you're not... That's super um, cool. It's not like a... It's a the... the, the um, if it was not a heuristic search and you're using instead a dexterous algorithm on this kind of thing, Infinite. you're right. Every single, <laughs> all six, all six, all six, and you just be spreading out, spreading out, spreading out, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, problematic. But um, that's where your priority queue so, comes in, which is very clever. Yeah, or it yeah, seems like a good um, way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's pretty standard for, for A-stars. Uh, that's kind of the, at least to my understanding, that, that, that's how most people do it. Gotcha. So you... Um... But it's it's not so you're only using these primitives of like extreme angles. So it's all the way this, all the way left, all the way right, or straight. If we're just doing the forward case, um, in this case, if I um, how how do you arrive at a solution where the robot doesn't drive like incredibly manically, doing all the way left, all the way right, um, on its way towards its goal? Yeah, so so that's where we have a, a, a smoothing step at the end of this. So so this is we, we do this, this is for the from how the search Thomas space basically. This is this is for you arriving at a solution, and then from that solution, you smooth it. Yeah. Ah. So so we have so we, we we've gone through this. We have now a, a path that is is drivable. Maybe yeah, a little swervy, but drivable. Um, <laughs> and so what we do is we take that path and we put it into a smoothing algorithm, which will you know take out some of those extreme turns and, and make them a little bit more um, uh, uh, or I guess less aggressive. Um, and then also goes through the boundary conditions to make sure that those remain uh, uh, tight during the entire uh, entire process. What do you what do you mean um, by so in what's the, that part? The boundary conditions and make sure it's yeah. tight. What, what do you mean by that? So, so sorry, tight, um, bad word. But um, so essentially, do you mean optimal we use a or pretty night? What What do you mean? Like a good so, fit, so low error, a, or I don't know what you mean actually. Yeah. So we have. Um, so in the hybrid star paper that is published that, that you know an, an autonomous driving company might use, for instance, has a pretty advanced smoother. And in fact, this is the smoother implementation we used to use within the Smack Planner um, that takes into account um, you know keeping spacing the same, which helps with smooth, smooth, smoothness, um, using a Vernoy diagram to help you know drive away from obstacles, and then uh, limiting the the curvature so that you you keep those constraints that you you had during the planning process, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think a couple other terms as well, and. Those then spin through an, op an opposition problem to give you an optimal solution given those those cost functions. Mm. Um, this ends up being a very computationally expensive thing to do, I and it's ultimately why I I removed that and instead switched, uh, changed up a bit of the internal systems of how the search the search heuristics operate, so that we don't have to use that kind of smoothing technique. Um, but what we use instead is essentially like a super super naive um, uh, smoother, like you might find. In like I don't know, like um, one of those Udacity nano degree kind of things, where oh. we just go through very simply and say like, let, let's make these things as close together as possible, and then iterate until we have very little change left in our in our in our outside path. What do you mean these things? Um, make these actually, things as close to each other. As, uh, yeah. What do you mean by that? Each of the the points on the path. Um, Okay, so um, in, in opposition land, it, it's maybe not as as intuitive to, to somebody uh, who hasn't who hasn't worked with it, but it's something that uh, that that's generally a, a very successful way of smoothing. Is just say, 
all my points of my path, I want to make sure that they're each as close, to, they're each even, evenly distributed from each other. And when you iterate over that and try to minimize that cost function, mm-hmm. you end up actually res- um, uh, smoothing out the path from from turns and such, uh, which is a, um, a convenient and, and easy. Oh, that's uh, a cool um, way of smoothing out. I see. Um, it's basically like the shortest path from something is straight to it. And so if you are making all your yeah. points closer to each other, um, you probably are working towards that uh, because they will be yeah, further so, away. That is a cool, cool heuristic to use to smooth. Yeah. Interesting. So if you had no no other other things bounding that solution, it eventually would, you're right, end up just being exactly Perfect a straight line. line and just ignore everything. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why you have to add in things like uh, uh, collision. Oh, totally. So that, like, yeah, collision they have to be valid. Available to it. For sure. Yeah. And then... Uh, because we, we derive a kinematically feasible path, we also want to add some weights on the original path itself so that like if you have a little squiggle that could be made into a straight line, we want that to smooth out. But we don't necessarily want something to turn from a, a nice smooth turn to just like, you know, Jagged, to, uh, like uh, carve in and yeah, drive or, over the curve just, kind of thing. Yeah, where it's no longer actually also valid by the current motion model. Um, and so... I have um I described this more in the actual the readme file and I don't think it's worth getting to the specific details of this at the moment but essentially you can you can um through logical proofs find that the only time when you'd break feasibility is during sharp turns at the beginning and the end of the path huh. and so those are the boundary conditions okay. so the boundary conditions totally break during this process so if you were to try to drive your robot using just that smooth I described um, both the start and the end would not be guaranteed to be drivable. So what we do is we have an additional post-processing step on the beginning and the end of it where we use the uh, kinematic motion model of the robot that we used previously during that planning technique to um, take the start pose and then sample across the new smooth path until we find a, the shortest path that, that goes from the, starting, the actual starting point to a point on the smooth path in order to give us a drivable connection point between those two, two areas. Hmm. Um, and so by doing that, then we end up in, with a smooth path that also then, then meets uh, the boundary conditions um, of drivability, and then therefore the end path is drivable. And so I, I don't know that I fully understand that, but can you think of it as um, just if the, the start and end will be wrong because of some weird boundary conditions in the optimization, you just extend them a little bit. So you consider like a little before the start and a little after the end, assuming the motion primitives just continue with something like this or... So I actually I tried that it didn't work, oh. uh, but yeah I, I did I did try that um, I, tried, I tried a bunch of stuff before I <laughs> I, I found the solution that, that that we currently use. Um, so essentially, so um, this is where it gets it gets a little in, in, into the weeds. Um, so within these planners, we also have a concept uh, called analytic expansion, mm-hmm. where occasionally during our search process, we take our our search position and our goal position. And we, we use a library called OMPL, the Open Motion Planning Library, which is commonly used for sampling-based planning implementations. Mm-hmm. Um, they also have a very good impl- implementation of the Ackerman models that you can use both for sampling, but then also in our, our example Ackerman for models, search. those were so, car models or four tire with two yeah. um, steering ones, the, the front one steer. Um, yeah, yeah. Like a double so bicycle or we whatever. We can use that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we can use that to then say, here's our start point. Here's our endpoint, and they're not points or poses, right? So they're, they're, they have yep. orientation associated with them. And then give me a path to where I am, to where I want to go. And then we, we then we check that for collisions to make sure it's actually valid. Mm-hmm. And most of the time during your, your planning, right, that isn't valid, right? It's going through a wall or something. So you throw it out and continue searching, and then maybe another 20 iterations to try again mm-hmm. um, until you, you find a solution. Um, and that helps a lot with the speed of the planner. Um, so most of your planning time in a kinematically feasible planner is spent actually on just getting to that exact goal position and orientation. So if you can speed that up by having something that'll find exact curve fits, that helps you quite a bit. Um, so we apply that same concept then after the smoothing process to say, here's our starting point, which is fixed as, as our as our starting yep. point or our end goal point, which are both fixed. And then we we basically say every, I think it's like five or 10 or some some, some number of points on the, on the smooth output, we find the, the feasible solution between those two things and we measure the length of it and we check the feasibility for it. And we do that for, you know, up until basically, you know, for, I think it's, it's bounded, but, you know, far, far into the, into the mm-hmm. path until we find the shortest, not collision-free path possible 
Um, the shortest uh, point here is actually very important because if you were to try to find the, the feasible solution between your starting point and a point that's you know just just directly in front of it, that's how it shifted just a little bit away. You don't get gain this loop to loop maneuver to make that work. Oh, and while I see that what might you be mean. feasible. You don't really want your robot doing a loop to loop. So we check. So we continue to march through that path a few times until essentially that loop to loop goes away. Yeah. Um, and, th- and that that'll be a shorter path than that full circular yep. path. I'm thinking of if you have like um, a to a piece of thread or something, and you try to move it. Um, you grab it in the middle somewhere with two point hands, and then you move it close to each other. It'll do a loop. And this is like your hands are the points, and it has to do a loop to go through both points. Um, this yeah. kind of thing. So, th- yeah, exactly. So we we we, um, we don't just just randomly march through it by like five points or whatever. There's a there's a more principled approach we, we use based on on you know sort the fact that we know that a loop loop is exactly yep. a circle, and therefore we can we can select interesting points on the path based on that on that circle, yep. um, the core of the circle. Um, and yeah, that, that's how we we constrain the boundary conditions to be uh, to be reasonable. And while that sounds very, it sounds like a very naive approach to it. Um, I will say it is very effective. And other things I did, which were maybe a bit more principled, did not work nearly as well. Yeah. So th- this is the uh, the solution ultimately we, we we selected. It strikes me that that's often the way in robotics, where it's like this simple thing works really well and is fast and um, solves most of the problems. Um, like a lot of our heuristics seem to be this way. Um, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so Sometimes. yeah, I mean, there's obviously exceptions, but, um, I'm just amazed how far you can get with simple representations for a lot of things. The, um, so is this, um, or actually once you have your, so you have your grid world. In your grid world, you use your motion primitives to kind of explore it for it to get from one cell to another. And um, then you get this rough path that goes from start to end. And then once you have that rough path with like crazy, if you're driving like crazy all the way left, all the way right turns. So it's all jagged. Um, Once you have that, then you run this smoothing function on it. And the smoothing function is going to, or a smoother on it. And that's going to make it so that you have a smoother path. And the like clever thing about that is you look for what makes the points the closest distance, because that's more likely the, uh, or that, that is the um, more optimal solution. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. More, more or less, more or yeah. Less, yeah. The only, the only, yeah. The only, the only uh, correction point I'd make there is: so when you get that path out from high braised star, it's 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 not near as this crazy thing as possible because right, we're talking about these really small motion yep. primitives. So if one thing is it's a little tweak, tweak. You know, you, you would barely even notice it really had a path when when you had something that yes. happening. It's um, true, but if you had a robot do it, we, it would be crazy. Like imagine being in a car that was following that one; it would turn all the way left, then all the way right to try to do something. That yeah. might be crazy. So, but, but then you also have like a local trajectory plot that's processing that information that's going to be smoothed out a yep. bit. But, but before we get into that too, too much, um, the the point I want to make there was that um, because they're they're they're, they're so small, small. Um, yeah. they really don't make that much of an impact. Yeah, yeah, like super small, like like two two grid cells wide. You know, kind, kind of. How big is a small. grid cell? So and, if we have an autonomous car, how big is a grid cell? In this, uh, it depends on your application. Yeah. Um, in, in my example, it's, it's, it's five centimeters, so it'd be oh, okay. you know, five and ten centimeters in size. Yeah, so super, um, so, super you know, small. very small. Um, and because we're we're working on with with optimal heuristics, mm-hmm. um, it's not like we're like here's a free space and we're woo you know wobbling all over the place. You know, it's it's very much so like like being driven towards that goal in a very reasonable way. Yep. And so that output path is actually already pretty pretty smooth and pretty good looking. It's mostly just like small, discrete, discrete um, planning errors that you're you're dealing with because we are working in this grid space, and not continuous coordinate space. Yep. Um, so that, that kind of feeds a little bit into the the, the heuristic functions that we're using here. So, um, like I said, we're able to simplify the smoother quite a bit because we made some changes internally to the planner for how the search is performed. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the two ways that we we, we approach that is um, in our traversal function. Rather than just just looking at the the cost value and the length of the primitive, we also uh, enter penalty functions so that we penalize the path from making those extreme turns back oh. and forth. So that if it if it starts if it starts to turn, we we penalize it stopping turning or penalizing if it's going straight to start turning. 
just a little bit, you know, a, a percent, a two percent, you know, something very small, yep. um, which ends up making it so things are, are quite a bit smoother on the output. Um, and the second thing we do is that rather than just using like a distance heuristic to say like here's how far I here's my goal here I am just 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 compute the you know Euclidean distance between those two mm-hmm. points and use that as a heuristic function. Instead, we use um, two two heuristics that we take the maximum on. One is the actual length of the path that would represent in Ackerman mm-hmm. space. So we take um, using that 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 mm-hmm. same idea we talked about with the analytic expansions and the boundary conditions. Mm-hmm. We take our current pose, our actual pose, and we find what that minimum curve would be. So we take the maximum of that uh, value and the value of a um, a new to this to this implementation um, that I'm writing a paper about actually currently, um, where um, it, it takes into account the obstacles within the space the same way the, the hybrid star has a similar heuristic, but it takes that into a cost aware uh, environmental representation. So rather than the um, smoother having a cost function in it that takes into account the Vernoy diagram, which is similar to a potential field. Um, to smooth out the, the path away from obstacles, mm-hmm. we have our actual heuristic and function that's driving the search. To, take into account the search or the cost in, during that process. And the potential field, that's just a way of keeping things away from something else, right? It basically says, don't come close to this um, obstacle. Is that true? or? Yeah, yes, yeah, so, essentially, yeah. So, so the Vernoy diagram is is computing a potential field where costs are high or low near obstacles and low or high in the, in the centers of, of yep. aisleway spaces. So essentially it finds these like uh, basically a graph of, of the centers and the, the nodes where um, like spaces like, you know, uh, collide with each other. Um, which if you're dealing with a stack environment, like if you're dealing with, if you're planning in a map that, that does not change over time, mm-hmm. like you might do in a, in a Thomas driving application, that makes a lot of sense. You're right. You can compute that once super efficient, knows exactly where things are in the mm-hmm. center works every time. Um, but when you're working with an environmental representation that's changing constantly based like on there's a bunch of data people and dynamic walking obstacles. around or something and you're driving a robot around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you have to, you have to compute that every single iteration, yep. which is super oh, expensive, totally. but we already actually, actually have a potential field that we're working with. that's already pre-computed as part of the inflation layer of the navigation stack. Um, so we actually use the potential field computed from the inflation layer. Inflation in order layer? To, um, yeah. So, so we inflate, um, from from critical obstacles um, like like my couch behind me, um, we're going to add a a uh, potential function off of that so that we have more cost the closer you come in proximity to that that yep. obstacle. And then, um, given the radius of your robot, if it's a circular robot, um, we apply then a lethal band of cost in front of it so that um, you know if the robot were to be centered at that cell, um, you know part of the edge might be hitting hitting the couch. Um, so because we have this this potential field already computed, we can use that to drive the robot away. Um, the robot, the heuristic search away from the obstacles just to begin with. Um, so you have um, because you have these. Um, sorry, what did you call them? What was the the cost or what was it? The um, potential fields. So, <laughs> you have yeah. the potential fields, and you basically say. This area, because it's static, we know we don't want to go near, and that one area will be defined. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But we also apply that to to to, to new obstacles too, right? People and stuff, because you still don't want to run into people. Yeah, for sure. And it's but it's it's similar. You can use this kind of expensive computational or this computationally expensive representation for static objects, but then a different one that's not as expensive for moving objects. So the, the potential field that we, we use for uh, in the inflation layer is very quick to, to update. So it's actually not very computationally expensive oh. at all. And that, that's why we use that within within the, um, the the planning for this implementation and not, not necessarily what you use for Thomas driving. Hmm. Um, another reason why we do this, um, which is like hard, it, it's a little subtle to explain, but um, so in Thomas driving, in general, you want to stay in the center of a lane, or you want to stay in center of a, a space which you are allowed to drive to, to, to main, maintain maximum distance away from, from everything else around you, um, or, or stay in the center of your lane, yeah. for instance. Um, but in the case of autonomous robotics, that's not always optimal. Like Sometimes you do want to do that, that, that. That's absolutely true. But a lot of times, maybe you want the robot to hug um, hug a shelf so that things can go in the opposite direction if you're working in a scene with a lot of robot mm-hmm. systems. Um, or there's just different behaviors you might want to have that currently in the NAV stack we allow you to, to tune oh. essentially by tuning that, that inflation distribution on that inflation layer potential field. And so 
basically, because we're using that information in the planning itself, that means that our, your, your plans are going to actually respect um, the tuning to have this, the tune system behavior you want to have based on the current, uh, the planning that, that uses that potential field yeah. as well. So you're, you're actually getting more flexibility where you can still define the system to operate that way if you but want you, to, but you don't yeah. have to. You can, That's yeah. cool. Um, how does, why do you call it inflation? So essentially it's, it's inflating um, the cost. Um, static obstacles or dynamic obstacles. In the, yeah, it inflates the cost in, 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 in the, the grid map representation. Gotcha. I was thinking inflation like in the economy or something. And it's like, I don't, I don't get the map. Okay, but, yeah. okay, it's inflating the cost. It's making it larger. Um, Another way of thinking about it is risk, which I think is, is really the, the proper term I should be using here. It, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's the risk. The, let's say the, the problem is with risk. That's cool. Okay. And then so when you are driving, the, when you are planning, um, what you'll do is at each location, you evaluate it for its potential and or for, for like how good, of the, how good is the position. And um, one of these things that you take into consideration after being like, is this valid or not, is the risk. And so if you want to minimize the risk, um, then this is used in your priority queue that you mentioned to, to sample more feasible and lower risk locations. Yeah, and and that that's another pensive function that ha- that can be tuned. Mm-hmm. So right, you can you can set it as the so I'm super sensitive to risk, and so I always want to stay in the center vials. That that's really important mm-hmm. to me. Or you can say, you know, I mean, obviously nothing would ever give you a directly in collision path because that that's invalid. Mm-hmm. You know, they're always going to be valid. Uh, but you can say that maybe like, oh yeah, I, I, I'm okay if it, if it if it's a little closer to obstacles because I want to be able to like you know hug a wall or hug a shelf or something, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, so so these are all, all all tunable behaviors you have access to because we're using. Um, the cost information in the search itself mm-hmm. and using the inflation layer to, to kind of see that based on the behavior of the robot system you want, you want to have. How does, how does this work? Is this only true of known maps? So if I have a known cost map, then I can use these? Or is, it, is the ability to tune inflation or risk of things, um, is it something that I can do as I am building a map of the environment? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Maybe you have like heuristics for features of both? the environment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both, I think, I mean, if you have some, I mean, if you, if you blindfold me <laughs> and then kidnap me and throw me in somewhere and say, build me a map and like choose some parameters, right? Like there, there are, there's a reasonable band of parameters space that you can, you can select. Um, and you know, if you're in narrow spaces, it might be better parameters than if you're in super wide open mm-hmm. spaces. Um, so if I do nothing, it's like, right. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell you, but you know, usually when you're deploying a robot, you have some general understanding the kind of space you're working so in. So you can parameterize it based on heuristics about what you know about the space. If it's very open or if it's very tight, you might set parameters differently that would change how these how, how the inflation um, of the cost map is generated. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Can you tell me a bit about the priority queue? I think that's really interesting. Uh, I mean that's just a, that's just part of A star, right? So I think I think, I think that, that that's gotcha. that, uh, I haven't any any resource talking about here to search would, would would explain yes. uh, more articulately than I would at the moment. Gotcha. Actually, yeah, I guess you're right that it is just um, a normal thing of A-star because you're only searching a subset on your way to the solution, a subset of possible options um, until hopefully you reach yeah, your option and, and I'm on, or your solution. I assume there's other ways of implementing it as well. Mm-hmm. That's just, at least to me, that was just my knee-jerk reaction of thinking, I have to do this thing. All right, I need to sort by lowest cost and, oh, ergo, Priority Q does this yeah. for me. Um, so easy, but... So then um, for you to, once you have this path that started as kind of coarse, but I guess the grid cells are so small that they, um, it, it's not that coarse, I guess, or it's not that jerky, mm-hmm. um, but you have this, you perform smoothing on it, and then you map it to motion primitive, or you match it, map it to velocities. Do you get this kind of for free with the motion primitives, or how how do how do you relate your path to motion to like the velocities that each of the wheels should go yeah so we have um that, that's where the the local uh trajectory planning also referred to as the controllers within the nav2 ecosystem mm-hmm. um kind, kind of operate so we 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 use what's referred to as the hybrid planning scheme um which which move it has recently started to migrate over to as well um but this has been kind of a, a built in feature of the nav- navigation stack since the very mm-hmm. beginning um so we separate the concerns of building a, a route from where we are to where we want to go 
we separate that from the process of saying, okay, how do we follow that mm-hmm. path? And so the following the path part is where we, we, we take that path um, that currently exists and we say, how do I generate a trajectory, which the difference between a path and a trajectory is that you have, you have velocity uh, and or acceleration and or jerk and or other derivative information uh, about the dynamics. Oh, of the that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Involved. So I wonder um, if you were traveling like really fast, might it change the path that you were able to take or things like this? Like, is this consi- it? Is it always fair that you can divorce the two? Um, in, I mean, is it, can you can you always no. do anything all the time? No. So yeah, there's, there's going to be some sort of like weird edge cases, I'm uh-huh. sure. Yeah, like, um, but um, generally speaking, for a reasonable mobile robot system, that that that's going to be a valid way of operating. Gotcha. Um, I while I'm not an expert in the autonomous driving space, my understanding of what they do is is primarily. Um, large scale route planning. So rather than having like a dense yep. path, like we have when we, we have like, um, you know, doing our grid search, they have like a sparse saying, like, go to this intersection, turn left, and then, you know, go straight. And then for a long time, then, you know, turn right yep. or whatever. And these are just basically like, like event markers for when to change doing, doing your event. Uh-huh. And then you have your local trajectory planner, which are computing like the, how do I like stay in my lane or how do I pass a car so I can meet that route given need. So there is no like path planning, path per se, for the so whole speak. thing. Um, yeah, exactly. So in that, that situation, then you basically only have the velocity uh, planner in that local time horizon. I see. You don't have the, the goal path planner at all. So it doesn't always even make sense to even have a, even, even have the concept of a long-term, you know, uh, path at all. But there are situations where, especially if you're doing just straight up waypoint following that you just gotcha. don't need it. So let's see, I, I want to get to that in a little bit, cause that's interesting. Or I guess when, um, so when is path planning most useful, I suppose? Like when when do you really need it rather than this kind of waypoint planning? I guess anytime you're using web point, waypoints, you have to get yeah. from waypoint to waypoint. And so then you have to do path planning. Or how do you think of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess I, I haven't thought about it in those terms before. I guess I, I think it usually in like certain cl- classes of applications. So if I'm like n- um, navigating around like, I mean, I guess it, it, it depends what you're going for, I guess. If you have like an, a last mile delivery application where it's like, you know, somewhat analog to an autonomous driving system where you have just a such an insanely large environment, it just doesn't really make sense to have to dynamically plan from point A to point B that's like 70 miles yeah. away or whatever. Um, you know, you, 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 you know, seven, whatever, 70 is a little crazy. Let's say seven miles away. Um, going on sidewalks mm-hmm. and, um, so you might want to do a similar thing where you have um, some, you know, Google Maps data or OpenStreetMap mm-hmm. data to say here are the intersections, and we're going to do a sparse route based on on intersection information, um, and then you're basically just locally just saying go go towards the intersection, stay on the sidewalk dynamically, you know, go around things, and you don't really need a dense path um, between those two two mm-hmm. spaces. Um, so, it, but then if you're working in like a, a warehouse space, the, the the two kinds of things you could do is also have like waypoints on critical points at the end of aisleways or whatever and have it, a sparse route going going between them but then you could also do a dense you know uh waypoint or a dense path planning methodology to be able to dynamically go around a lot of a lot of areas and i think it just kind of depends on what kind of robot behavior you, you're looking for um you know largely static staying in these lanes staying in these straight lines or being more dynamic and able to um you know navigate free space more flexibly mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then going back to getting the, uh, so you separate out the planning the path to from planning the velocity commands you were talking about. Yeah. So 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 th- this is all kind of like the referred to as like like hybrid mm-hmm. planning, um, which which uh, is is this technique of, of splitting uh, these the things apart. Um, so then within within um, the NASDAQ, we have several different options for local trajectory planners, which then take that path planner output of the of the just the kinematic plan of here are some points i want you to follow um and convert that into then velocity commands to the motor um the most the most simple to explain is is probably the the regulated peer pursuit controller that we currently have uh, which is new new to nav2 not, not available in ross one um and what that will do essentially is um pick a point on the path that's a at least a certain distance away maybe up to a maximum distance away it could dynamically change depending on the robot speed for stability mm-hmm. reasons um so it selects a selects some point on the path and says uh, what is the curvature required for me to if i were to pick one velocity command to, 
to, to drive at, to hit that point exactly on, mm. on the dot. And then it, it, it finds that curvature. And then from a curvature in your curve position, you can then back out what the velocities you need to apply in order to achieve that command. And then so you, you, you say, okay, robot, do this, drive this, this, this direction um, you know, on, on some sort of point on the path. And then the next iteration, let's say, you know, one one hundredth of a second later or one twentieth of a second later, um, you you say, okay, well now what now what point on the path am I interested in? And you do the exact same process over and over and over again. And as you're driving forward towards that goal, that goal is constantly being changed on mm. you. So you're essentially following this carrot um, over over time. So that that's 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 one very simplistic way to convert your path into velocity commands then for your lower level electronic motor controllers to you know, use a PID controller or whatever to convert into voltages. Gotcha. Or current or you know, whatever that was common. Yeah. Um, so how do you, uh, how does NAV2 work with, is it, we talked a little bit about the um, potential functions for, or the inflation, um, but how, how does it work with a bunch of people walking around or uh, constantly changing environments? It just recomputes yeah, so it all this the time. Is where or how do you how do you think of it? Yeah, so this this where the sensor data is really important, so that you have information about what's now changed the world. And when, once you have that, that 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 information, you can input that into the cost map. So this might be from sensors like sonars um, or RGBD mm -hmm. cameras, which provide you depth maps, so it gives you give you uh, points as well as color um, uh, information, or or two D lidar. So for the for the vast majority of things, navigation two operates out of the box with primarily depth, depth values. It wants to know where this thing is relative to a sensor mm -hmm. frame. Um, with that said, it, it's it's not hard to integrate modern AI techniques into it as well. We have plug-in interfaces, so you know, this is all possible on the sun as well. Um, but once we have this dense, dense information, we can input that into our into our grid map representation. Mm -hmm. And when we say that we we, we had a, a sensor reading hit, hit a person that's mm -hmm. walking, we can say, okay, there's something here, input that into the grid map as a lethal obstacle. And then we can inflate then our cost map uh, with with that inflation layer we talked about, which adds that potential function mm -hmm. to it. So then the next cycle, when we want to compute a path plan, that's now represented in our environment and it can navigate mm -hmm. around it. Then um, most of these algorithms have clearing mechanisms so that once um, this this obstacle is gone from the scene, then we can we can clear it out using ray casting from the sensor to that to a clearing measurement. So basically, a measurement of nothing, right? If you don't see it anymore, it's therefore mm -hmm. gone. So you can ray cast from the sensor frame to that to that point and clear out any cells in the middle. Because clearly, these are going to be um, unoccupied. If you're able to view something much further away, everything between that measurement and your ah, sensor okay. is, is clear. Um, which then rem removes that lethal obstacle, which then removes that inflation perspective. So the next time you path plan, it updates and, and th those things are gone. Gotcha. So is the general way that you run this, you run it over and over again um, and constantly are planning and replanning? Yeah, um, you don't have to, but that, that, is, that, is a, that is the default behavior currently. Um, I'm, I'm actually, there's some pull requests open and I'm working with some folks to kind of refine this behavior additionally to remove some, some uh, oscillation behaviors that can sometimes exist in that situation. But essentially, yeah, every one second or so, we're computing a new, pl a new path given the new representation of the environment. Um, but this is where the, the way that NAV2 is structured differently from the navigation stack starts to really be helpful is that we're using behavior trees to orchestrate these different capabilities. So the environmental, or sorry, not, not the environmental models, but the, the uh, path planner, the recovery oh. behaviors, the, the local trajectory planners or controllers, these things are all controlled by a central um, uh, system to, to control the flow of data so that we can um, manipulate how the navigation system is operating. So this is done through what's referred to as a behavior tree. Um, and I definitely recommend uh, reading more about that than I'm going to be able to describe in, in less than an hour. Uh, about <laughs> Would you try trees. though, like quickly? Uh, yeah. Imagine, yeah, yeah. So imagine you had like a tree-like structure like you might find in a computer science um, uh, uh, course. And if you don't have a computer science background, I'm sorry, read a book about it. I can't go any, any, any uh, less detail than that. Um, I've heard. Of, so oh we, yeah, go we ahead. have these. The, I, I've heard a good halo. So you have these different where like uh, video games often use it, and the behavior seems kind of uh, it's like fallback conditions. So, um, like uh, if if you want to get into a house, a behavior tree might say first try the door, and then if that fails, you fall back to do I have keys, and if that fails, then um, 
you see if you can knock. And if that fails, no one comes, then you um, break the window. And like this kind of thing where it's fallback, 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 all structured by the I want to get into the house thing. Or, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's that's one of the, the primitives you can mm-hmm. work with. Yeah, um, um, fallback nodes, sequence nodes are kind of the two, two big control flow types, but you can also define other, other types with more more use case specific okay. behavior. But essentially, this, but this, is, this is all um, modeled as a giant tree. So you have like a, a, a root node, which then has different branches to it, which then mm-hmm. have their own node, which have different branches to it with different um, methodologies for controlling the flow of data between, the, uh, or sorry, controlling the flow of the nodes execution model um, by these different fallback or sequence uh, control mm-hmm. flow nodes until you, you reach your leaf conditions, which are, sorry, leaf actions, which are, that are, are, you know, do something or do something, something value specific. or check yeah. something. Okay. Yeah. And so all the navigation behavior is then defined through these behavior trees, which then can be reconfigured to do different things mm-hmm. for you. So if you don't want to replan every second, you can replan every 10 seconds. If you don't want to replan ever, you can have it so that you use only one static path. If you'd like to replan only when that current path is invalid, you can also do that as well. And these things are all really easy to implement. Um, these are all through plugin interfaces, so you don't even need to fork mm-hmm. Nav2. You just need to implement your own custom plugins and then you know run your own custom behavior tree model and you still use the, the available binaries for Nav2. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible. Um, we offer significant documentation about this because we understand this is going to be a new concept for mm-hmm. most users where we kind of talk about what are behavior trees, why should you care, where are some of the nodes we give you access to, why should you care, uh, what are some of the um, examples of behavior trees we offer you, why do you care, and then what is our what is the default behavior, and then walking you through exactly how um, the the, inter- or the, um, the the execution model of that behavior tree goes through on a tick-by-tick basis so you can have a reasonable understanding about how, how the current behavior mm-hmm. acts. And so this helps your program figure out what it should do when by finding certain events or how, how does it, um, like if I, if I have a, say, say we have a simple example of a robot getting from one position to another and a human gets in the way or something, how would that look kind of in behavior tree space? Um, so we, we don't have the environmental data um, set up through the behavior tree interface. Mm-hmm. So that just, that really wouldn't be important for at least how the, the, the current behavior navigation works. It, gotcha. it would or what, what would be a good example? Like if we can trace through some of what a behavior tree does um, for some simple case, what would be a good example for that? Yeah. Let me just, let me just pull up an actual example so I'm not just uh, making okay. things up. So I'm, not, I'm not good at making things <laughs> up on the fly. <laughs> Um, this one is relatively simple. Okay, oh, that's not simple. <laughs> um, let's, let's do distance. Okay, so for for instance, like we might have a a sequence which was in behavior tree land. A sequence um, is say do this task. If successful, do this task. If successful, do this task. Versus a fallback, which say do this task. If it fails, do fall back to the next one. If it fails, fall back to the next one, mm-hmm. et cetera. Uh, within within uh, all of the the children nodes on that control flow of the sequence or the or the, or the um, uh, recovery. So, an infantry tree might be operating to do to very simply just to replan um, every second um, or, or every time you 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 are tr- you travel one mm-hmm. meter, for instance. So you might have a sequence node that says, okay, um, start to sequence, sequence node here. I say, okay, go with my first child. And my first child would be a decorator node called a distance controller. A decorator node is just something that has one child and defines the behavior about when that child is ticked. So for this instance, it'd be it'd be checking if it, we've moved one meter. Another example would be if we've we've uh, if there the time has moved by one second or that my speed is ten meters per second or you know any sort of random condition you want to set to to, to define whether or not you want to mm-hmm. take this child. So we have our sequence node, we go to our decorator to say, do we want to actually recompute a path? Yes or no? If this is yes, then we go down to that 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 compute uh, compute a new path um, mm-hmm. behavior tree node, and that's going to put then that path onto uh, what's referred to as the blackboard, which is essentially a parameter system that is shared across all the nodes mm-hmm. of the behavior tree, so that any node can input or change or modify parameters it's like a on the blackboard, state and any other node. 
Um, you should no. not use the first state with behavior trees uh, ever. Um, but it, it be, there should be, yeah, it should be the state should be defined for the tree. This should be mostly parameters or values that you need to be. Well, it could, uh, I mean, in terms of state, um, would it be like, be... Um, or could it be like we've traveled one meter? That would be something you put on the blackboard. Um, yeah, as long as it's not state about the execution of of the behavior tree, like you shouldn't have like a blackboard node that is saying check it check the blackboard for a one or a zero for whether or not oh, they okay. should execute um you could do that i mean you yeah. could i mean nothing's stopping you uh but you shouldn't <laughs> um it should be based on on computing values uh, uh separately so the behavior trees think about it is for parameters or dynamic values but should what not would be an example state, of uh, something you put you could if you need to yeah, so so example here is like the 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 the, the path. So once we're once we're in our sequence and our and we go to our decorator, we compute the path. The way that we get that path computed to the next node up the tree to okay follow the path is through the blackboard. And so because this node and this node can't mm. to talk to each other, so they can only pass values through oh, the blackboard. Okay. So we have our compute path update the the blackboard variable for the path. And then when when we go back up to our tree, back to our root, yep. into our sequence, and we say, okay, we, we recompute a path, then we go down to our, our um, follow path node and check to say, hey, there's been an update to this this path blackboard variable. I'm going to throw that to my local trajectory planner, and then, then it's going to compute the, the control effort required to to, to execute. Um, and then if our what's, what's nice about the the um, this decorator node is that because if it fails and says, no, we've mm -hmm. not moved one second, it's going to fail and go back up to the sequence. And because the sequence node only continues going down its children when it when the last one succeeded, it's going to exit and say, okay, I'm done. So it's not even going to try to, to execute the, the follow, follow uh, path. Because it's uh, failed, yeah. Um, so it so doesn't try anything further. Yeah, so as a result, yeah. So so in a, in a very simple behavior tree with like, you know, one, two, three, four nodes, essentially, um, we just, um, you know, just did planning, um, dynamic replanning of a of 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 a uh, of a path, and then throw it into a local trajectory <laughs> planner to execute. Yeah, you know, that is the at, the at the core level the most simplistic um, way of representing um, you know dynamic hmm. navigation. How does this compare to like a state machine way of representing this information? I assume that there are advantages to choosing to do a behavior tree to represent kind of these transitions. Um. Yeah, I mean it's preference more than anything else. Um, so I mean they're they're both they're both execution models you can use mm -hmm. to define how you like your system to behave. And there's not necessarily a benefit of one over the other. Um, it's more about preference, and maybe certain applications are are more simple to model one mm -hmm. way versus another. Um, for instance, the the move base um, was a state machine back in ROS one. Um, you know, it, it was statically set, so it wasn't using some sort of like external um, state machine library that's reconfigurable and all that kind of good stuff. It's you know hard coded. Here's our here's my state machine, um, and that works pretty well. Um, and it's pretty easy to define simple state machines to do something like this this mm -hmm. dynamic replanning. Um, essentially, what I just described was the move based node, except for uh, we're not replanning every meter, we're replanning every second, or I think it's configurable. So mm -hmm. however often you want to do it. Um, but essentially, that, that's the exact same thing. But what we just described this behavior tree is as an XML file, which is loaded at runtime, um, dynamically allocates the nodes, and then and then executes. So you can change your behavior over time. But there are other state machine libraries that exist that that can do those exact same things. Um, and almost anything you can model as a behavior tree, you can also model as a as a, as a hierarchical or finite state machine, mm -hmm. and back and forth. Um, but we just prefer, in general, working with behavior trees. Um, we actually ran a study on LinkedIn uh, last year asking users what they prefer to work with. And we had 70% of people say they'd rather work with behavior trees. So this is why we work with behavior trees. Um, but certainly there, there are other options and they're all valid under, under the sun. Um, it just depends on... Yeah, whatever makes it work. Okay. So um, NAV2 has... So there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts to this. Um, <laughs> I'm so it goes from and actually we haven't talked about the cost map that you can generate um, through this. So in um, so if in your initial mapping, kind of more slam like, so actually creating a map while you're driving around it, Nav two does this as well. Um, yeah, um, it doesn't do it through it's like the the slam library we use is not actually built into the navigation stack. So right, you go to GitHub.com, you know, rock client slash navigation two. It's, there's no slam okay. implementation there. 
but we have a strong integration with a library called Slam Toolbox. Um, that I, I largely built uh, wells at Symbi Robotics and continued to re refine uh, while at Samsung Research in mm -hmm. my first few months there. Um, and so that's what we use primarily for um, generating maps. Um, that this is what all of our tutorials are based off of. There's binaries released for it. So from an end user perspective, based, it, yeah. it is part of yeah. the navigation stack. Yeah, but it's it's sufficiently complex that it should not belong in the same place. Um, I think Slime Toolbox has almost as much code as half the nav stack wow. just by itself. Yeah. So it's very complicated. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, so it, it's worth keeping this, these products separated. Um, I'd also actually like to remove um, AMCL from the that? nav stack as well. Um, the, um, the Adaptive Monte Carlo localization system, essentially it's the uh, methodology for localization in an existing map. Um, and AMCL is the um, you know very common like probabilistic robotics implementation of this uh, of this algorithm. So um, it does it works on two D maps right these two D occupancy grids that we've we've been talking mm -hmm. about with this grid space discussion prior. Um, and the reason why I want to actually remove that from the stack into a potentially different repository is that I want to get to the get get the point across that Nav two is not specific to two D mm -hmm. navigation. It does not require. 2D localization, 2D mapping systems. If you want to work with a 3D map and a 3D localization system, totally valid. If you want to work with a visual slam system, and visual localization, cool. totally valid. Um, and I think that, that that even whilst one got a bad rap about that because AMCL was included in the stack and there weren't examples of other um, localization systems within the stack to, to kind of showcase that you can utilize different hmm. methodologies. Um, so I'd like to remove that. And it also adds support for 3D um, uh, uh, positioning methodologies as well. So that way, um, you know, we, we, we get the point across that you can use really anything you want. Um, this is just what we provide by, by default because it works well. And this is what um, other users are, are, are yeah. leveraging. So if you had, say, uh, like a, a quad rotor or some sort of flying robot, you could use Nav2 just as well because of the plugin architecture, in a sense? or. Um. I, maybe I, I don't know anyone using yeah yeah There's so other... this, this is mostly ground robot systems so it's 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 mobile robots surface marine applications so boats ah. and that kind of stuff i mean it's meant for like largely like like you're working in a surface environment um our, our environmental models don't really work with like three-dimensional spaces to have like large height variations so if you have a drone that's flying very high or you have like a, a submersible robot going very low we don't have a lot of um we don't have the capability right now of modeling those gotcha. environments effectively. Um, it's not that the planning algorithms couldn't be made to work in three dimensions. That it's just they were. That's not the the current um, um, niche that we're trying gotcha. to, to solve. So I'm a little confused about the Sorry, the last point. Then you were, you were saying you want to remove this. What was it? AMCL or you and it? Yeah, I, fair I just yeah. didn't quite understand. So you were saying because so, so I from, was assuming this was primarily for two D planning. So if you want to move um, on the ground. Or something like this, or are you saying like with different floors, or yeah? So, so these are two different topics. So, what one is that? How do we represent our space? And right now, we do this through a two D planar cost map representation mm -hmm. of the environment. So, this is a two D plane, but you can add additional oh. layers to represent things like like height cha height changes. So, you can work on other other terrain models. That said, that's not really optimal, and um, longer term, um, we want to be replacing or adapting Cosmap 2D to be um, operating both with height information as well as risk information as well as to, um, you know AI detection based method methods, so that you can you can uh, work it all with all these kinds of spaces. Um, but at the end of the day, the Nav2 system is serving the niche of surface gotcha. robots. So whether it's surface in the ground, surface on a lake top, you know, but generally speaking. Um, mm -hmm. You're working on a surface. Um, and then there's the other problem of, of localization. So right now we do primarily 2D localization using mm -hmm. a 2D laser scanner, um, which then takes like a slice of your environment, right? You don't see a couch. You see a straight line that represents mm -hmm. the edge of the couch. Um, and so that has, you know, a, you, right, you're throwing out a lot of information, right? You're throwing out the, the texture of the couch, which might have some interesting features. You're throwing out the shape of the couch outside of that, that just that 2D slice of the world. Um, so we want to be able to support um, localization systems that can take advantage of more contextual mm -hmm. information of the environment than just two D laser scans in the two D kind of like you know flat Earth world. Gotcha. Quite cool. Um, let's see. I, I want to segue a little bit. Um, how has how has it been for you being so involved in the community? Can you just talk a bit about your experience working with the the Nav two community, growing it, working with developers and 
leading an open source project. Yeah, no, it, it's it's definitely been been different. Um, so it, it's it's a different challenge to work with people that aren't paid to work for you, <laughs> kind of thing, right? It's like you know these aren't my these aren't my, my my colleagues where we have like we need to get this thing done. We're all being paid by this company to accomplish mm-hmm. this particular task, um, and I'm not managing people where I can just say, "Here's what you must do because we must get this thing done." Here's the project we're working on this this month. Um, it's it's a lot more. Um, it has to be collaborative and you're building coalitions with companies and you're building collaborations with individually, individual mm-hmm. people um, to get things done. And so, you know, there has to be a lot more, more mentorship going on. So I have to be, um, you know, uh, not just assigning projects, but talking to people about what they're interested in learning, where they are right now, where they want to be going, what kinds of things interest them and engage them and try to carve out project like individual projects or small sections of larger projects that they can work on so that they can have that those personal growth elements, but then also contribute back to the project mm-hmm. at large. Um, so there's, there's a lot of mentorship that, that, that goes on that, that, I mean, which also would happen in, in hopefully a corporate environment as well, but it's a little bit different, uh, because no one's being, being paid to work on this, for instance, they, these are all just, um, uh, volunteers with their off time, or maybe some companies who are, or are giving engineers, you know, every other Friday, you know, four hours to, to, to play around with stuff or write documentation or help out mm-hmm. with various things. Um, so it's, it's a lot more, um, yeah, collaborative and, and building building coalitions um, of multiple companies to work on larger projects together. Uh, since these are being worked on primarily on a volunteer, you know, part time basis. So when we're working on some of these larger projects, it's often um, it's either just me myself working on something, or it's me building coalitions of you know a couple students with a, you know a representative of company A and a senior engineer at, at company B. We're each kind of doing their kinds of things, and then I'm. You know, popping in to help you know re- resolve disputes or help with design mm. decisions um, and you know implement some sections of this myself so that uh, we can continue, continue moving forward. Um, you know, the Smack Planner is a great example of of a of a, of a coalition project. Um, you know, I put out the the bones of that largely myself after um, you know many many months of work um, that only contained the Hybrid Star Planner. Um, had some some bugs in it and all, all that kind of stuff. And um, over time, as companies started using it, we had um, a couple companies go through and really start benchmarking performance and help me find some areas we can improve things and 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 made some pretty substantial improvements to it um, that we're currently working through through merging at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also have worked with a couple of students where instead of just having this this hybrid HR planner, I also wanted to add a state lattice planner so we could model arbitrary motion primitives and not just Ackerman models. Um, and um, I, I found a couple of folks that were really interested in this thing as well, and were helping me, um, you know, build out file formats for caching information, um, building the local uh, um, uh, primitive files uh, offline for what the the actual primitives are of that search pattern, um, other than Ackerman models. Um, we had uh, folks working on uh, improving the um, um, analytic expansions to be more efficient and deal with cost information mm-hmm. more effectively. Um, you know, it's just a lot of folks that are working on a lot of different things that end up coming together to build, you know, something new and interesting. Um, and so it's, it's a, yeah, a lot of my time is spent um, coalition building and getting new people involved in the project and finding out what excites them and where I can kind of, um, where I can put them in the project that is both helpful for the direction that we're going um, or even potentially changing the direction that we're going. If there's somebody who can spend a lot of time on it or is very senior that wants to see the certain thing happening, um, sometimes I'll, I'll shift my direction to kind of help support them do that, do that thing. Uh, since uh, um, a lot of the development that happens in the NASDAQ is um, opportunity-based. So there's an opportunity to integrate something new or somebody has some time they want to spend working on this thing. Um, sometimes I'll drop what I'm doing and go <laughs> rush over there because uh, if, if, I, if I get some help in some area, For I'm sure. not going to say no to help. Huh. Um, what do you it, – it's interesting to hear um, that it, it shifts really to community building and coalition building. Um, and you mentioned that it's a little bit different with um, not being able to like give people deadlines and things not easily. Um, w- w- what do you think of open source as like a business model? Yeah, you know, you know, I I don't think about that honestly, <laughs> so I don't know. Couldn't really give you too much. I mean, I I, I know like you know folks like Pink they're doing this. You know, Open Robotics is doing this, and some other folks I've, I've chatted with as well are, are doing this, and. Um, and I think that's that's a good direction to, to to bring money into a project to to fund development in a particular area. But um, you know, I, I really like being able to work on the hard problems that are necessary because they're gaps and they're needed, and not necessarily just working on who's going to you know throw money in my face and mm-hmm. say go do this thing. 
Um, cause sometimes it's hard to get funding for the things that are really important. And, you know, you would open robotics. I mean, you must know, understand that with the, the build farm and documentation and things like that. It's hard. It's hard to get some people to throw money at the important things that are the big gaps that, that, that are felt. Um, and so, you know, maybe down the line there, there's, there's a, there's an opportunity for NAV2 to, to have a similar kind of, um, you know, open source business model to have that funded. Um, but that's not something that I'm currently thinking too much about, or I've executed anything on, or, um, have any plans they need to future. Gotcha. So I love your thoughts on that anyways, though. Um, let's see, how, how can someone get involved if they want to, um, like say someone is interested in learning more and interested in the possibility of mentorship, um, what should they do? Yeah. I mean, the first place to go to navigation.ross.org, that's our documentation website. Um, I spent an inordinate amount of time very good documentation. Website I'm very contains, impressed. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's uh, a lot yeah. of nickel and diming. It, it's, you know, a page here and there, one thing every Friday you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, but yep, if you go there, you can find our tutorials, you can find our getting started guides for how to just like, get from, from absolutely nothing to installing ROS2, getting the binaries, doing your first demonstrations in Arviz. Um, so that, that's a good place to get started with the actual NAP stack itself. If you want to start contributing, um, we have a community Slack um, that can give you the URL to, to, to include in this uh, description we'll of this podcast. Um, that's a great place to, to, um, to, to reach out uh, either for assistance or to ask questions or if you want to get involved and you want to see, see where you can get involved in, um, that, that Slack group is a great place to be. Um, and then generally just looking at our, our product issues. So our, our um, issue tracker is very active. It's where everything that, that's French being worked on is, is being discussed openly um, and also um, searchable later on. Um, but, you know, don't, don't restrict yourself to those things. If there are some other features that you see missing or some gaps that you want for your product or your research or whatever, um, you know, file a ticket. Let's, let's talk about it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, I'm not God. I don't know everything. <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, what your, what your product needs that we're not, we're not servicing. And I want to understand what these gaps are because I want to build this into be the, you know, right, not just like a navigation system, but be the navigation system. Like, right? the, 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 I want this to be the standard library for mobile robot navigations that, you know, it doesn't even make sense to use anything else because this, this mm -hmm. is so feature complete. It has so many options and plug-in interfaces. So, um, and I think we're, we're, we are definitely getting there. Um, so yeah, if there's anything missing, uh, I want to awesome. hear about it. And um, just going back to uh, like more for mentoring and things like this, or what, um, so if someone wants to contribute, uh, should they already be a roboticist or can they like what level should someone like what level of skills should someone have if they want to contribute? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what you're interested in working on. If you're okay with, with, with doing some more like small discrete tasks, I mean, basically no experience is, is, is required. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes folks that, that reach out for that are working on things like testing frameworks um, and helping me out with, with CI issues. Um, and these kinds of things. And then over time, as you build some, some confidence in the concepts and the, in the, in the, uh, the code base, we can build those into larger and larger projects that are maybe more substantial and, and uh, more rewarding. Um, but in general, um, ROS, having some ROS backgrounds, especially ROS2 background, uh, just is, is always helpful. But you know, I understand that a lot of folks, uh, this will be their first experience is working with ROS2. So we're, we're, we're always willing to help work, work through those, those problems. Um, so really not, not much required, but um, if you are more experience have more background in these concepts you can certainly make much bigger of an impact much quicker um because you know you you uh can understand the gaps where are, they're important for you and your research and and where they are in, in navigation it, it's it's roadmap um you can help fill some fill some of those gaps uh with some of the more substantial projects awesome. and um what advice do you have for say someone who's at the beginning of their career Yeah, I mean, just just dive in. I mean, I think that's that's the biggest part. Like, don't um, don't wait for somebody to teach you something. I guess, like, you know, my background is in aerospace <laughs> engineering. My 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 like, I did I wrote zero uh, Python as part of any course of work anytime during all of college. Um, I learned embedded C when I was in high school. Just my my dad was a software engineer, and we we did some projects together. Um, literally, like my first job. At SMB, like day one was the first time I'd ever really written substantial wow. C++ code on the plane to San Francisco. I was reading the C++ <laughs> standard manual um, to, like, to, to learn the semantics because it's been a while since I worked with C. Um, and so uh, it, you know, just just dive in head first and start start breaking stuff, look at errors, get confused. You know, if you're willing to be excited, interested, and spend the time doing it, um, you know, you can you can go from zero to to expert, um, you know, fairly quickly. Um, it just requires uh, grit and uh, the desire to Love do it. so. Um, and kind of big picture question, 
Uh, where do you think robotics is headed in the next two to five years? Um, kind of continuation of what, what's happening right now. I think like a lot of the, the warehouse companies are starting to go from like medium scale to like really like, you know, every warehouse in the world's having it. So I think that that, that, that trend will continue. Um, I think the delivery robots will get a bit, will be a lot less teleop and a bit more um, autonomous, hopefully. Um, but I think there's still a long way to go there. I think there, there's a there's a missing there's a technology gap right there that that, that exists. What is it uh, today? What is the gap? Do you um, think? Um, going from like my first like semantic segmentation and detection models to like something that's like super robust that mm. works in all situations. Um, I think it is, is a big is a big part of it. I think there's a lot there's a lot of folks working with just like out of the box demos of TensorFlow, <laughs> and they work well enough, but not well enough. You can actually just leave a robot to go do its thing, and, and especially in the outdoor space, we have cars and, and yeah, whatnot for sure. move around. Um, and, and I think there's a, there's a there's a big gap there, and in, 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 in when you do have the, the small number of companies that can go over that, it's because they had millions and millions and millions to spend um, to hire all the right people and, and, you know, collect these huge trained data sets and all that kind of stuff. And that, that, that's, uh, not something that everyone can do. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, hopefully we see a lot more mobile manipulators starting to reach the market and actually accomplishing, um, useful tasks. I guess right, right now there's, there, there's that promise right for Bill Garage of, you know, special box that had, had a product, uh, other folks that have had a product, but they didn't really go anywhere outside the research space. But uh, I'd really love to see those start really taking off. I think that, that would get me excited to go back into the manipulation space if, um, you yeah, know, I started seeing that, that 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 was starting to take off again. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Steve Masensky. Thank you again to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. See you next time.